Good evening and welcome to Omnidog's Vault. Tonight we have a special guest with us. We're going to interview Philip Kennedy Johnson, the Minister of Comics, and I. Mr. Johnson, how are you today? I'm great. How are you guys? Actually, I should say, is it Sergeant Johnson? Uh, it can be. It's whatever you want to do. Well, <laughs> actually, my first question <laughs> is about... Fort Meade by the NSA. Okay. Um, and what instrument do you play? Trumpet. Trumpet. Nice. Yeah. Here's the connection between, besides Alexandria and, uh, and D.C., my dad was the director of the uh, Sixth Army Band in the Presidio back in 19... <laughs> uh 49 through 51 oh wow okay and then he went to korea and then a bunch of stuff happened and, and then i was born in 1959 i got that from my brother and sister who are much older than i am yeah uh but there's the connection between us army band in the venn diagram there's the little <laughs> here we are now we're like family yeah right and, co <laughs> and comics comics is really important oh Love yeah comics that's true yeah <laughs> comics that's right um now, I know that we both, uh, Taylor and I both loved Last God and want to talk a lot about that. Oh, thanks. I'm glad and, you that. Oh, yeah. I, I mean, it's definitely going to be in my top 10, if not top five. I specifically did a video of it with um, Monsters by Barry Windsor Smith because... Oh, wow. That's a great book. Yeah, because I both... They weren't similar, but they were both great books that I wanted people to focus on and read. So that's why I did a video um, on them. And so Taylor and I have been trading sort of uh, our opinions back and forth. And there's actually a Venn diagram of books where Taylor and I actually meet in the middle on books we really like together because it doesn't always happen. Taylor has made the analogy that I'm the guy on the raft on the ocean of comics just happy a little let the comics wash over me while he's the scuba diver that goes down deep and analyzes everything right. underneath well this is the perfect uh, book for analyzing because there's so much back matter so much lore so yeah. so much this this hardcover is kind of taking the collected editions world by storm it really i mean it seems like it's selling really well a lot of people really love it we hear a lot of stuff about it so it seems like it really blew up recently I'm glad to hear that. Yeah, I haven't kept up with sales and how they look, but I know I'm getting a lot of really great feedback online. And I mean, the format is beautiful, and it just I feel like it's the it's a format that suits that particular story very well. It's it's nice to have it all in one place, you know, along with all the back matter and everything. Yeah, the back matter is what um, we I'd like to talk about first because to set up such a it's a it's an epic fantasy that. Um, covers a, a lot of territory, physical territory, moral territory, ethical ethical territory. Um, but in the physical territory, the, the cover actually folds out into a map of the entire area where the uh, travelers take their journey. And it's, it's pretty amazing. And one of the things that I liked um, is this, uh, the pinnacle, <laughs> where um, soul siphoning mechanism, emergence chamber, portal wind windows, flesh weaving chamber, <laughs> yeah, Grandmaster's vault annex, and the library. Um, to to write this, there's a as Taylor said, there's a lot of lore that goes with it. There's a lot of history and back matter because not only do you have the stories. But you have to read the interst interstitial stories because that's where all the lore comes together and the, and the back matter and the tales are told with songs and music written. And now I know why there's music written because you're a musician too. Um, but it seems like a, a really complete epic journey. Did you start out... Where, where do you start out on an epic fantasy like this? Do you... Do you have the main story and fill in the backstory, or is it a little bit of both as you go along? Well, I, I wanted this to, I didn't want this to be the small ball version of, of our favorite fantasy stuff. You know, like the, the best epic fantasy books um, are the ones that feel the most real, you know, the, the most legit. And I mean, when you're comparing to stuff like Tolkien, or even from a world building perspective, I think George R. R. Martin does a really fantastic job in Song of Ice and Fire as well. 
um, just making that place feel lived in and, and real, like all these different cultures kind of bumping up against each other. Um, I didn't want to do the, you know, crappy surface level version of that. So I, anytime, um, basically I kind of fell into this habit of writing, of answering every question with another question. Like if there's like one example that I give sometimes is, um, a scene in the first issue where you see, um, Evander and his friend, the, another slave walking down the streets. And I am describing the, the streets of the slave cradles. Um, the place where they live, and I'm trying to describe the difference between how the what the the architecture in the slave cradles look like versus the 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 architecture in you know Palace Square, where it's like you know it's been there longer. And um, and I started, I kind of asked myself the question, okay, like, well, why, like, how would it look different here than there? And I started kind of figuring out how the slave cradles would have been kind of torn down and rebuilt over and over again how that would have used clay rather than stone. Like, okay, well, why is that? And just kind of answer every question with another question and try to go down the, the rabbit hole deeper and deeper and deeper. And as you do that, you find that the world kind of fleshes itself out <clears throat> and becomes much more authentic, you know? Um, it can't just be surface level crap. Yeah, there's the seed, exactly. And if you, you know, for the observant, like the, just the walls of the, the buildings just look different than they do on a, a more established part of town. So there's a part of the city, there's like an, an inner, there's a, a wall around the oldest part of the city. And then there's a wall around the, you know, the younger part of the city that happened a couple hundred years later. And there's this whole history that kind of grew out of these questions about like who built the city originally? Um, when did it fall? When was it rebuilt? Who rebuilt it? You know, just if you keep answering questions with other questions, this history kind of emerges. And that's, that's what we did here. So how long from conception of the original idea to the execution of the first issue did it really take you to build this world? Um, it took a few months. I, mean, I took I took about a month <clears throat> in which – so af after I had just the, the basic, the most basic concept, um, from that time until the first issue was actually done, I, I allowed just a basically a full month just to do nothing but world build and not actually script yet um, and just kind of make the world feel more legit for a while and flesh out the details, not of the characters or their emotional conflict or anything like that, nothing specific and more just the, the history of that, that whole world and how, like what, what race relations are like, what the different religions are and how they inter intersect. Um, yeah. I just allowed myself a little bit of time just to kind of make all that um, feel authentic. And then that, that became the tapestry that everything else kind of, you know, laid on top of. Have you received any people, musical people, who've actually like sang your songs and played the music and sent you the audio file, or have you gotten that yet? Um, I don't think so. I, I re we recorded some of the music ourselves. We actually made trailers for the first few issues. And oh, cool! I had some of my other musician friends and I recorded some of that music, which is pretty cool. Able to Where, check that is out. that on YouTube? It is. Yeah, Just look for, look for me under my full name on YouTube. I have a channel there, and some of the there's a there are three trailers. The first one was. Um, the music for the first trailer was just called The Last God Overture, and it's instrumental. But for the second trailer, we took a song from the first issue, Pedal Black, Pedal Gray, that everyone's kind of like the the people drinking in the square before they get eviscerated in that first issue. You, right um, here. <laughs> that's it. Yeah. Pedal Black, Pedal Gray. Um, that's that's the first song that appears in the book, I think. See, Pedal Black, Pedal Gray, Pedal Took My Mom Away, but she come back the very next day. You know, etc. And it's if you pay attention to the lyrics, it's about the coming of the, the plague of flowers. And um, we recorded it. It's meant to be this little nursery rhyme. You know, like I, this is uh, really interesting to me how so many nursery rhymes that we just kind of don't think about actually have pretty dark origins and kind of have <laughs> dark lyrics when you when you dissect them a little bit. Like ring around the rosies. Exactly like that. Yeah. 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 London Bridge is falling down or whatever. Um. So I wanted something like that. So we went up this it has a kind of a, a pretty little melody. But um so we recorded that. We had like some I got some some friends' kids actually to um just chant the lyrics like pedal black and pedal gray, pedal took my mama away in this really creepy way. And then <laughs> and then we, we played the melody underneath it on guitar which is kind of kind of pretty and, and happy. It's like a major key. And then we put a, a minor 
bass note underneath it to make the whole thing sound super creepy. And it was fun. Anyway, that's the second trailer. And then uh, the third one we did, we used the song Sleep. That I think I think it's from the third issue, which is kind of a, a prayer that the, the Elva used to kind of shepherd the dying into the land of the dead. And uh, we uh, we recorded that one as well. Well, I will put a uh, link to your YouTube channel in the description of this uh, right after the interview so people can go uh, there. I, I wasn't aware of it. Now I really want I want to hear your uh, your versions of your songs now played that <clears throat> because the, the, the pedal song, the last couple of notes, the last few notes really sounded uh, kind of renaissance to me. Um, I, I assume that's how you wanted it to be yeah. like a king and his court sort exactly. of to be played on like the mandolin or something. And with the fools jumping around in their jester uniforms and stuff like that. Right. And the uh, Simeon in the chat says he has a D and D uh, gaming table and they ate last got up. They spent half of their night just flipping through the book. <laughs> oh man. Thank you so much. That's awesome to hear I, that. I love hearing that. I have heard some of it. Of that I've heard people talk about how they they gamed using the um, the source book, which is incredibly rewarding to hear. I just love the idea that people are adding to the to the canon of of Last God. You know, with well, that's place. that's the other part. There's a whole gaming source book at the end of this with all kinds of rules and everything. I'm not a gamer myself, but I can appreciate the work that had to have gone into create uh, creating a board game like that with dice and everything. Um, yeah. I, when did you create that? Well, I wrote all the running text in the in the source book, all the stuff about the like the the characters and the races, the character classes, the um, let's see, magic items, the regions, all that stuff. The the you know how magic works and everything. That's all me source myths or uh, creation myths. But my um the actual gaming like the stats and the mechanics, the gaming mechanics, but how to how to play it with D and D fifth edition. That all comes from my editor, Amadeo Torturo, who mm. Amadeo is just an incredible. Well, so when Amadeo is not doing comics, they're um, tabletop gaming, they're huge D and D nerds. And um, let's see, so they um, and they brought in Dan Teffler, who is a, a prominent voice in D and D. He runs a D and D podcast, I believe, to um, to do a lot of the heavy lifting too for some of the mechanical you know, rules and all that in the source book. But as far as the running text, that was on me. That was mm. the reason that there is so much back matter. The back matter was not originally part of the gig. Um, but when they found out how much I was doing of it and it's how much there was, that was not even making onto the page. Like even these songs, um, not much of that actually was, was going into the interiors of the, of the comic. And when we found out how much there was, I basically like Amadeo or somebody would ask me a question like, so how does this, how does this magic thing work? And I'd answer with this like treatise on, well, here, <laughs> here's the history of magic and you know, from these centuries to these centuries. And uh, they're like, damn dude, there's a lot of this. Like, do you want to do a, would you want to add a few pages of back matter to that back of every issue? And I'm like, hell yeah, I would. I mean, I just, I love, <laughs> I love being able to, you know, show people, you know, how, how deep this goes. And, and readers uh, love that too. Readers love yeah. having extra bang for their buck when it comes I to know. the issues and the hardcover. Yeah. So they're like, um, just hang, uh, holding up the, um, it's a little, it's a thing written by a, uh, um, a sort of historian, like an amateur historian in tier who, who basically, you know, analyzes this old tune that appears in the book and we get the, the sheet music for how it's, you know, how you actually read it in, like how we would read it in our notation, but also how they read it in their notation. So I, I wanted oh, to, okay. I wanted to make up our own. That top one there is a, a music notation that I made up for the for the this world. That, that's how the few who can read music read it that way primarily, because um, it just felt fakey to to have you know a treble clef, bass clef type type music thing on the on the page since they wouldn't have that in in uh, Cana Noon. Yeah, th this has all kinds of rune type symbols and st stuff hanging off the chart. Yeah. There's a lot of thought put into that writing system. I had a, a few different variations on that, but at first, the first couple of versions that I had that might've even been a little more practical just didn't look like music the way that we would recognize music. Like the, you still, even with those symbols you see, there are still traces of like note heads and ledger lines and like 
bars and stems and things that you, re you recognize as being ind indicative of music. And some of the other systems that I was experimenting with didn't have any of that stuff. So like if you, if you really, you know, pick apart that music, the notation system, it'll start to make sense to you. Like where, where the, the ledger lines are and, um, in relation to the the fragments of note heads and things, it starts to make a little more sense if you really like. It's all legit. You can you can compare it to the the traditional music notation below it and decode it the way you would language if you wanted to. Then the the, uh, the the length of the stem actually actually um, dictates where it is on the beat. So like if it's a, if it's a stem that goes all the way up to the top to the flag above, that's like the beat. So on that first line there, that's strong like on beat off beat. It's like downbeat, upbeat, downbeat, upbeat. It's like a, like running eighth notes. Da, 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 and then there's a pause where that where the flag bends. That indicates a new measure, basically. And then, uh, yeah. Anyway, I won't I won't go down the I won't nerd out too hard on this, but yeah, <laughs> nerd out all you want. This is of, amazing. You put more thought into this comic than I think any other person has in their own comic. Yeah. <laughs> the only other series I can compare this to in terms of world building is my favorite comic right now is Lazarus by Greg Rucka. That's a great and one. Yeah. There's just so much like his the last fourth of his hardcovers is just world building and back matter. And you even have you have even more, which I didn't think was possible. Because it's all throughout the entire book. So it's really, really impressive. Well, thank you so much. It was a real labor of love for all of us, for me especially. <clears throat> and a lot of this stuff comes straight from Ricardo's brain too. There's um in the first issue, towards the the back few pages of the issue, there's a when you see the palace on fire. Um, I just described very briefly the palace on fire and I, I described it as kind of a, I think I said something about it being like a Roman style building kind of, there it is. Um, let's see, let me see the bottom of that page. Okay. Next page, please. There's a, there's one specific moment I want to show you. Yeah. That, that statue at the top there. I didn't say anything about that in the script. Ricardo just threw that in there. <clears throat> and the thing about that statue is, um, Tirglot is a very patriarchal society. It's all about men. It, it's a, I mean, it's descended from the rivermen who are super hardcore patriarchal. Like women don't even the women the names of women there are not even recorded from generation to generation. So, if there's a woman in history that uh, played an important role, her name is lost forever. Um, so for there to be a statue of a woman in such a badass pose like that with a spear and shield would be kind of unheard of. But I didn't, I'm not going to tell Ricardo to take it out because it looks awesome. <laughs> um, so instead, I was like, well, that's pretty badass. Like, how, like, who must this person be? And then I, I made up this whole backstory for who she would have been. And that was the, that was the source of the character Q Lee, Queen of Rivers, who ended up being a, a super prominent character in the back matter. And then it was also, you know, kind of became an important, yeah, there it is, part one. Translated and adapted by Pauli Scrivener's son of Tearglad. Yeah. <laughs> and you have a big um, step up on those who are writing fantasy novels that you have this collaboration with your artist who yeah. can add stuff to the world. I think it really adds an extra level of depth and authenticity oh to it as well. Yeah. Especially with Ricardo. Ricardo is just a savant, just a, just a crazy genius. I, I could not believe the work that, that Ricardo did on the series. Um, cannot say enough great things about Ricardo. I mean, I mean, just that that thing with Q Lee was just a just the tip of the iceberg. I mean, there was a um, a thing later in the, I want to say the third issue where this there's this monster that shows up that was not meant to be quite as it was, the design originally was supposed to be very different than what ended up being on the page, but what what it, how it turned out looked so much more badass than what I had envisioned. I'm like, oh my god! So I, I gave it a much more prominent role after that, and it, it really pushed. Was the, it that uh, guy? No, that's not it. That's the Ursulon. That's actually one of the heroes. That's in, oh yeah, that's right. <laughs> um, yeah, that's gray. The the Ursulon. Right, right, right. Okay. Uh, the last last check out the last page of issue three if you can find okay. it. Okay. Yeah. Um, it's the um, the Crown Wraith, or I guess in the behind the scenes we call it the Baby Wraith because it's uh, when they're on the bridge to the to the oh the things that are swarming them. Um, well, they they see the. Or, okay, the, wait. I think I know the, what you mean. You see the woman's corpse holding a holding holding corpse of her child that died there on the bridge. Yeah, and then this whole thing, like, um, uh, what's his name? Mol Ultep speaks to them through the corpse of this baby. 
Right. And then it grows out into this gigantic thing and, and that's it. And it just looks so much more awesome than I had envisioned um, that it became like this recurring thing that kept showing up throughout the story and, um, and even makes it into the source book too, like a whole nother category of, of flowering dead that I wanted to make sure we worked in there. And that's all that's a lot of that was inspired by Ricardo just because his work was so incredible. I had only known him from the cover art that he had just started doing for uh, the Batman family, maybe one in 25s. And I thought, oh, this looks cool. I hadn't heard of him. And so I started collecting those covers just because I thought they looked cool. I generally don't collect floppies. And then I get an entire 12 issue book of his art. And I <laughs> was blown away by how gorgeous it is. It's unbelievable. The first time I saw his work was an Aquaman. I, uh, I had done an Aquaman annual a few years ago that I was super proud of. I did that with Max Fumara and I'm a nut for Max's work. It's just, he's just so great. And I couldn't wait to see the trade. It was going to be in the, it was like the end of the trade of uh, like Aquaman, you know, trade number four or whatever it was. And um, couldn't wait to get it. So I opened it up. And um, at that time, Ricardo, excuse me, Ricardo was doing the, uh, the monthlies and opened it up. And it was like, holy shit, like, who is this guy? <laughs> and it looks so different from Max, but also just in incredibly good. And I, um, he has this way, kind of just this Frank Frazetta kind of epic quality to his superheroes and just fell in love with it. And so when, um, when uh, Amadeo, my, my editor, uh, came to me about doing a potentially a epic horror fantasy book, and we were kind of batting around names of artists. And he was like, what do you think about Ricardo? And I was like, are you serious? Can we get Ricardo? And I was like, I think you might be into this. And I was like, if you can get Ricardo, do whatever it takes. To <laughs> like we were, at first we were talking about getting two different artists, like one for the, the, the Pat, like 30 years ago arc and one for the 30 years later arc. But <laughs> with Ricardo, I was like, who's going to hang with Ricardo? Like, who are we going <laughs> to, who are we going to get for the other half? I mean, it almost doesn't make sense. And so we just kind of kept batting it around because Ricardo was busy and he had other stuff he wanted to do, but it, it, he ended up saying yes to the whole thing. And thank God for that. Cause I, I can't imagine. I mean, plus it gets a little into the weeds later in the story where you're getting into creation myths that don't take place in either timeline or the, the two things kind of weave together. And then it's a question of like, well, who does these other weird pages? Um, so it just made sense to get Ricardo to do the whole thing. And thank God he wanted to, cause it was just, it made the book. But I a just, lot of people in the chat are saying they like the hardcover, but they want to have a deluxe or an absolute at some point so they could really have a blown up side. Uh, you they know, I've heard that. that from others too. I'm, I'm glad to hear that. Thanks for saying that, guys. Yeah, his his art is absolutely worth the absolute edition. I love the interaction between, um, I can't think of her name, but in the Ursula. Oh, Scyanth? Yeah. Scyanth and, Ur and her Ursula and Grey, yeah. Yeah, I'm so proud of those characters. I, I science is probably my favorite character. She's she's. I think so that, too. Yeah. I mean, it's it on its face, it seems to be a story about Tyr and then Avender later, like the two the two Conan looking dudes. But really, it's about I mean, it's, it's science story probably more than anyone because she's the one who kind of ties both both uh, fellowships together. Right, and and I will say that <clears throat> um, I I don't know how it read as single issues. But to me, it organically flowed beautifully as a collected and in, in uh, the black label edition. Um, I I would I would have preferred it to have been a deluxe or a larger size book. Um, but when it comes to DC, I'm like, well, okay, I'll take anything I can get at this point. And so we got <laughs> the standard size, and um, I, the art is just gorgeous. But it also flowed really well as a collected edition with the um, going back and forth between the two times and the two traveling parties. Um, and uh, it, it was, I, in the, in my video that I made about it, I made it clear that these, um, inter, I call them interstitial stories, but they're the lore, um, they're the lore of the times and the basis for um, the basis, there's a lot of history in these about uh, the world that these um, people are living in currently and 30 years ago. Um, but I, I impl implored people that these were not to be skipped because they had to be read to really understand 
what was going on in the book, that these were just as important, to, in my opinion, these were just as important as what was going on that was illustrated, because this was a lot of where the world building was. Thank you, man. I'm, that means a lot to me to hear that. I so much like that thing you just showed us, him to Fraith. Uh, if you check out the um, <laughs> the reason that that strip on the left is in white is because that's it's uh, it's meant to be like a, a like a graven stone. Um, it's that's it's supposed to be the first the 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 oldest recorded uh, language that is that exists in that world is ancient Cumric, which is like like old English basically in that world. And we kind of uh, so you know if if you read something that's old English in real life. It doesn't look like English at all, right? It looks almost like some uh, weird variation on German or something. Yeah, and it's uh, but if you kind of pick it apart, like and compare it to modern language, you can kind of see some of the relationships between how this word might have become this other word. Um, not with every word, but some words, and um, we kind of reverse engineered um, English that same way, and kind of took okay, here's the modern word. So modern English to us is modern Cumric to them. So where might these words have come from if it had come from, if it had sent it from some other language. And so I made up this whole language that legit works like that. Everything on the left there, that's ancient Cumeric. And I've got glossary, a glossary of like hundreds of words there that allowed us to put this thing together and make it look like an actual like Epic of Gilgamesh style, ancient poem um, that kind of talks about, it's a, like a, a poem of um, like a song of praise to this false God that the rivermen of worship. Um, and there's this whole backstory about how they came to worship this God and where, like what, you know, where they, where the mythology comes from and all that. So as I just want to, I want readers to feel respected, you know, I just want them when they're reading it, I want them to not feel like they're getting the bullshitty version of anything. Like they're like, if they like, no matter how deep they dive into this stuff, I want them to feel like there's going to be more to find. And cause I promise there is, I've got, I've got <laughs> gigs, like gigs of just word documents of all this stuff. And I, I see people in the in the uh, in the chat in the chat talking about it. Yeah, there we go. Asking if there's going to yeah. be more, and I definitely have more arcs in mind. Yeah, I've got another. In fact, the very the very end of issue twelve is kind of a teaser for what I would like to do in the next arc. It's uh, this song. You know, I'm a I'm a music guy, so like I and the whole thing with the song, and it's it's um, <laughs> spoilers. It's actually it's it's about the song is a, about. Um, some of the characters that we've met already, either in the in, in the the issues or in the back matter, um, centuries ago, it's about Hakon in his heyday and a couple other characters we've met in the in the back matter, and that's the story I really want to tell. So, would love to uh, to get back there again. I, I think we will too. I mean, the, the fans have been incredible on on this series. Ricardo and I love working together, and we're spoilers. are working on to, together on another thing right now. And um, I know he'd love to come back to this too. So I uh, I think we're probably going to come back to this pretty soon. It says book one on the hardcover, so we have to have a book too. Exactly. Yeah, there's 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 more. I could write this the rest of my life. Well, I'm a big fantasy fan. I love Stormlight Archive, Brandon Sanderson stuff. I love Joe Abercrombie. What are some fantasy novels that you really love or fantasy series that you're really into? Honestly, the ones that made the most impact on me – are probably not. I mean, I'm I'm not going to surprise you with any any huge uh, obscure names. The one that mean the ones that mean the most to me are are ones that people have heard of for the most part. Like I mean, Tolkien for sure. Um, and actually, the the Tolkien thing that I like the most, well, as as that was actually I should say that that was most uh, inspirational for the Last God, is actually the Cimmerillion, which not a lot of people say. I know it's not like a it's not a narrative in the traditional sense. It's not like a a story that follows a specific, you know, cast of characters. It's more like reading the Old Testament or something. <laughs> it's all world building. That's all it really is. Exactly. That makes sense for this book. It's this master class on world building, exactly. And I just love reading that thing. It's just, yeah, it's just so there's just so much respect and love in it. So, um, yeah, similarly for sure. And I mean, obviously, his other work. I, I mean, I actually prefer The Hobbit to the to the Lord of the Rings. I, I really love. I love that the the fate of the entire world doesn't hang on it. It's just like this adventure, you know. Um, and it's just this whimsy to it that I really love. Um, as far as the world building, I love the the Song of Ice and Fire. There are shortcomings, but I, I just I love how real that world feels and how there's all these different cultures and it's just the world is just so messy, you know. I just it, like the real world is like in uh, in our world. There's not the the common tongue that we all speak, you know. There's not you know the human language. There's all these different languages and 
different religions and they all kind of contradict each other. And that's how I like things to be. Um, I, I hope he actually finishes it at some point. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. I don't think it's going to happen. The He's end of the show was the most disappointing thing to ever happen to me in terms of entertainment. So yeah. uh, I hope the books at least get something better. Yeah. He's I don't been wanna... lamenting this for at least two or three years to me now. I was, I remember like I got my wife to watch. It was a big deal, a fantasy show. She was super into, into it. We loved the first seven seasons. We get to the eighth season. It was like, what happened? Like that was just, and then it, it's, not, it's one of those things that was so bad for me. I can't even watch the rest of the show again. And so that's one of those things where it was just so it's such an epic disappointment on all levels for me. Yeah. That kind of, that was Dexter for me. Like it was, it was such an amazing yeah. show and then suddenly it wasn't. I, um, We're getting the reboot. Yeah, I know. Well, I hopefully kinda, that'll help. Like fool me twice, shame on me. You know, I'm, I don't know what to do. <laughs> Wait for the reviews. <laughs> yeah. Right. The, as far, yeah. As far as the, the uh, game of Thrones show, I was, I was surprised that they cut down that they shortened the last season because that seemed to be such a direct cause of the problems that we, that we found. Anyway, I don't, you know, I don't want to get in down, down that, <laughs> down that shoot, but, um, um, you asked other, other influences. My first fantasy influences probably were the Terry Brooks Shannara books. Okay. Um, I had this really small town, <clears throat> um, small town library that was pretty modest, didn't have a lot of stuff, but they did have a lot of Stephen King books that I read a lot of, and they had the Shannara books at the time. I think they had like the first three or four at the time, um, like sort of Shannara and then the, the immediate sequels. Um, and later I discovered the uh, Ursula K. Le Guin books, the Earthsea books, and those were really great too. And I love the simplicity, but the, like the rules of the magic system was really great. I have, a, I have this good friend in comics who hates the shit out of the Harry Potter stuff. <laughs> and, and the reason is because like, there's just no rhyme or reason to how magic works. It's just, he just hates that. Um, but the magic is just kind of like poof. You can just make shit up. Like he just, he hates that, hates that. There has to be some kind of a price and a system and rules and all that. Like he's, he's approaching it all as a, a gamer, you know? Right. And, um, and I never forgot that. I didn't feel that way about those books, but I, I never forgot that opinion. That made a lot of sense to me after, after he kind of laid it out. Um, so I, I really wanted to take that aspect from the, uh, from the Earthsea books. I love how it's all about naming the thing. Like if you can name a thing, you control it and that you can, you can follow that to then its nth degree and kind of make a whole system around it. And uh, I love how that all just made sense. And so when I was coming up with the magic system for, for this world, um, I wanted to make sure that there were rules and all that there was um, that it was fair, you know? And I, so basically it, it all comes down to the, the creation myths, although I can't say myths, I guess, cause it's all in, it's supposed to be true where these um, there's a kind of a pantheon of gods. They all come from Angluthea, the creator that made everything, the author of the world. And um, they took, like it or they or whatever took part of itself and made the, the things that we call gods now. And each one of those, when they died, became an, like a race or some kind of a creature or some kind of a thing that then had control over that god's like jurisdiction or whatever. So you have dragons that come from Mal Rangma um, and how they're the thing that fuels their magic is the... Um, the consumption of life and also the fire fire is their thing. And, um, the descendants of Mal Cheresh, the, uh, the, uh, God of the thing made, um, like their power comes from the earth and that earth, I guess it's not earth, but like the ground we'll say, whatever. Um, let's see for, for us, it comes from, well, humans don't have it. Humans do not, are not descended from a God actually, which is why we don't have any magic of our own. The elves come from, um, sorry, it's been so long. I'm kind of drawn blank on some of the names, actually. But the um, Maul, whatever, the, the god of goddess of light that ended up uh, passing their power onto all the Elva, their power comes from, um, sorry, not of light, shit. Now I'm getting all confused. <laughs> <laughs> the, the goddess of light became the Fae, actually. And their, their power comes from light and sound. Um, the goddess of uh, the thing that grows. So the Elva, their power comes from, you know, things that grow and the wind and the rain and, you know, all that stuff. And humans don't have that because we were like, we're not God born. Um, so we had to come up with our own reason, like our own way to have magic. And that comes from this 
evil dude who discovers that if we consume the bodies of the Godborn, like that's how we get power. So we have to actually take the bodies of dead Elva or, you know, find ways to trap magic power, you know, within the corpses of, of uh, Godborn creatures. And like, so we have, they have armor and weapons made from cannibalized, you know, bits of, of other creatures and all that. And eventually we're able to kind of weave together this, um, um, you know, this stolen version of magic. And that's how the Guild Eld Eldritch comes about. I just want to focus on this, yeah. which I just stumbled on that shows how great of an artist uh, Federici is. And what is, did he design this god there? The I mean, that's more what is it? Mal Ultep, yeah, the god yeah. of Void. That it is an amazing. Wait, let me make sure I get it here. That is just amazing right there. And then it shows the infection on Tyr there. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, that page was meant to have kind of a, a dreamlike quality where all, there's no no panels to speak of. They all kind of weave together. And yeah, the design of the gods, that was all Ricardo. When he started giving us um, concept art for these, I mean, every single time I'm like giggling like a little kid. It's just <laughs> unbelievably beautiful. Every character, every god. They all, every page is like a painting or something. I know, yeah. totally. I mean, yeah. that I mean, that variant cover of number of issue number one, that is literally a painting that he did and, and owns. Wow. Like he brought it to New York Comic Con and I was there with him and he like he showed like he, here's the, the painting that he put on canvas. It's incredible. He's almost too good for comics. He's like a, a Dutch master born too late, you know. <laughs> Do you have any original art from him that you uh you purchased or that he gave you? Uh he from did the give series? me one page. Um God. Sorry, I don't have it on me. I'm not sure where it is. That is somewhere in my office, I think. I'm glad you have it, though. I do have it. Hold on. <laughs> okay. Yeah. We're happy to wait. Luckily, I'm wearing pants. Yeah, I'm not it. either. All right. <laughs> okay. Wait. I'll highlight you. Sorry. There we go. Sorry. Let's see. So this is the last page from issue three. Okay. Let me see if I can pull that up real quick so we can compare. Sorry, those stupid ring lights getting on there. There we That's go. That's okay. Did he give you like a choice or just the one he offered you? He did, and I obsessed over it for like 20 minutes. I was like, oh my God, they're all so beautiful. <laughs> oh, wow. He had just finished all the um, the pages for issue three. And this last page, if you remember in the book, that's there's a, the last line of the song, Sleep, is, uh, is what's on the page during this. This is the moment where Evander apparently died, like falls and dies. And there's a, a line there from the, the end of the sleep song that is in that trailer, that third trailer. Ah, okay. God has grant me sleep, commit me to the dark. Yeah. Can you read the rest? Yeah. God has grant me sleep, commit me to the dark. Let not the dark God make his mark, but hide me in the deep. Yeah. So that's a, that's actually a, a song like a song form that we made up for the story. Like every, every line, every uh, stanza is, you know how like a, um, a haiku is always five, seven, five with syllables. Um, with this, I wanted it to be five, six, eight, six, because I love that. I love that haiku starts typically starts on a strong beat. Like the, the odd numbers gives it a strong beat to start each line usually. And, um, I like iambic pentameter too that you find in like Shakespeare. Like, um, God, what's an example? Um, um, it's come on, Taylor, over help again. Him out with oh me. no, I don't know. know. <laughs> Where we lay our scene. Like, um, I, what's the first line of Romeo and Juliet? Called on again. Two, two houses. Here we go. Here we go. Here we go. So, <laughs> two houses, both alike in dignity, in fair Verona, where we lay our scene. So the way that iambic pentameter works is every other. Is, is always weak, strong, weak, strong, weak, strong, weak, strong, weak, strong. It, it 10 syllables each line. So it's always starts in a weak beat, ends on a strong beat. Um, two houses, both alike in dignity. Like every strong beat is every other beat, right? And I like that. But I also like that, uh, I kind of don't like that it always starts in a weak beat. In fair Verona, where we lay our scene. So, uh, and plus there's so many syllables in there, it kind of doesn't lend itself to music very well. So I uh, came up with a new system, which is five, six, eight, six. So in that first line, you start, you start in a strong beat. And that uh, that system became the format for sleep, that song that's in there. Goddess, grant me sleep. I like the song. It starts on goddess, like on a strong beat, right? Okay. Um, 
And what's the next line? It's six. Commit me to the dark. Oh, goddess, grant me sleep. Commit me to the dark. Let not let, <laughs> let not the dark god make his mark, but hide me in the deep. Yeah. So every uh, the strong beat is every other beat throughout that whole poem. And um, it's got the little uh, their symbols for music attached to the box, yeah. which is yeah. amazing. And that that leads me to the uh, the Ami dog who laughs comment. And I think this too. It is wonderful to hear how much thought and care went into this. Oh well, when, thanks for saying that. When you, I agree with him. When you've come up with your own system of iambic pentameter, uh, and what uh, what is it? Is it PKJ and pentameter now, or what? What, <laughs> what word are we using for it? PKJameter, yeah. PKJameter. <laughs> oh, I like yeah, that. Copyright that. Trademark yeah, it. PK. It's written in PKJameter and. Uh, ben Uncles has a good question. With Last God, you got the back matter to share some of those ideas you developed for the world. Did you find with projects like Low Road West that you developed the world way more than made the page? Thanks because, for asking. Yeah, that was a, that was a cool because, project too. Because he had a fault. Uh, I'm sorry, Ben. Because there was a ton of world building there with some huge ideas that must have been left behind given that the series was only a five issue mini. Yeah, you're right. Uh, we were hopeful that would have been that would have made more of a splash sales wise because I had a lot more I wanted to do with it. Um, sadly, it didn't really the sales didn't quite back up what we wanted to do. But um, but yeah. So for those who haven't read it, Low Road West is kind of a, a reimagining of a line, the line of the Wish and Wardrobe, but set in post apocalyptic America. So if if you remember in Line of the Wish and the Wardrobe, there's a bunch of kids who are fleeing the Blitz in in London, like they're getting bombed out by the Germans. And right. Then, you know, the kids are getting trained out to, you know, the country to save them. And in um, Low Road West, our East Coast of the United States is getting bombed out by our by foreign adversaries, and we're getting invaded. And this is big, you know, end of the of the nation kind of a thing. And they're they're busing kids west, like they're supposedly San Francisco is this, um, kind of sanctuary, you know, city. And um, but there, there's so few resources at that point that the buses there's not enough fuel to get them to San Francisco anymore. I mean, the the country's falling apart, so the buses are just driving west with kids until they just until they run out of gas, basically. And they just, the kids are left wherever they are. And so there's yeah. there's this bus full of kids from New York that is that gets stranded. Um, or Washington DC, I forget, maybe it's New York. Um, they get stranded in um, a Dust Bowl town in Oklahoma that's by then become a ghost town. And they find a doorway to another world as their world is is ending, basically, as the United States is falling apart and the world is is over. They find a doorway to a new one. And um, yeah, this is post-apocalyptic fantasy tale. <clears throat> and the, this, the town itself has all these mysteries about like what's what's going on there, what happened there. Um, there's all this, all these little clues about what happened and things that we're going to, that we're going to turn into bigger ideas. But, um, yeah, sadly we left it at five, but who knows? I mean, if, if things keep going well in other books, maybe we can come back to it, but yeah. Yeah. Thanks, yeah. Ben. I appreciate that. Um, let's see. Here's Jimmy Owens saying Philip is an incredible writer. Oh, thank you, Jimmy. That's very kind. Jimmy's a big fan of the show. I appreciate that. Uh, oh man, there's some nice comments here. Um, yeah, I'm trying to decide which one um, uh, <clears throat> that I can put up. Um, well, Joel J is kind of leading into what I want to talk about. He said he's loving Superman so far. Whoops. Oh, sorry. And we'll talk about aliens if we have time. But I would love to hear about Superman. I know yeah. you, you worked on Future State, and then you did Superman and Action Comics uh, together. Now you're just doing action while Tom Taylor does Superman. Is that correct? That's correct, yeah. So, they, yeah, they... When the, when five G was kind of coming together, you guys are, you know about the five G thing. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So th when that was all coming together, I was brought in to kind of steer the ship on the cosmic stuff. And when because uh, I I mean in house at DC they noticed how much work went into Last God and they wanted to bring some of that world building to the cosmic line. So we were putting together some of that, but then things changed. The ideas what we we're going to do changed, and uh, they were like, well, let's let's do this differently. And asked if I wanted to pitch some of those same things for. For Superman, I was like, yeah, yeah, I do want to do that. So we, um, so we brought Superman together, and they they dug what I had pitched, and they're like, would you want to do Superman in action both? Um, it wouldn't, with the understanding that it would not be forever, because they had a, they had very clear plans for John Kent. Um, but I wanted to do the Future State stuff, the House of L book, 
that was part of that as well, like the Superman family in the in far in the future, and um, do both series for you know about half the year, and then kind of funnel it into this big event that we would do on the action comic side while Tom was writing the John Kent story, and um, yeah, that's how it went down. Um, so, um, sorry, go ahead. You, no, that's I. I just wondered. Um, so you had an approach for the cosmic side, <clears throat> excuse me, but then they wanted you to do it specifically for Superman. Well, it, it, it lends itself pretty well to Superman already. Like it's not, we didn't just, it's not a square peg in a round hole situation. There were some things that Superman was going to be a part of anyway. Um, and but you hadn't set out to write a Superman book necessarily. Not originally. I had, I had a different kind of plan at first that was going to take a, a little corner of the DC universe and really blow it out and make it a more, more significant thing. Yeah. What I'm trying to get to is that, is it, I, I don't want to make a general, a general statement, but is it every comic writer's dream to write a Superman like series of books and not like a one shot? Were you thrilled to be able to write Superman? Is he hard to write? Um, wait, let me ask you one question at a time. Were, <laughs> were you thrilled to write Superman? Yeah. What, was that like a dream come true? For sure. No, he was, okay. he was my, my first hero. I mean, it's I, I love the Christopher Reeve film. I love the comics I was reading back then. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I learned how to read from those old Superman and Batman books. So to get an opportunity to write Superman, I have such a clear vision in my head of who Superman is. And whenever I see a book that doesn't fit that, whenever I see a version of Superman that doesn't fit my version in my head, in my head canon, I kind of write it off as fan fiction. Like, nope, Superman, <laughs> Superman wouldn't say that, wouldn't do so that. So who is your Superman then? Like, what is your version of Superman that you have in your head? Well, it's not. it doesn't fit one specific writer artist team, um, but the version I have in my head is... He's all about, so people talk about Superman as being like embodied by the idea of hope. Like hope is his one word summary. Whereas for me, Superman is, I mean, it's not like hope is a bad way to wrap up that character. I mean, it's, he's definitely all about that. But for me, it's about compassion and humility. Mm. I love that. I, he's the, he's the uh, antithesis of the cliche. Absolute power corrupts absolutely. Like the fact that anyone with great power must inherently be corrupted by it. And Superman is the proof that that doesn't have to be the case. I love that Superman is essentially absolutely powerful, but he wields it with absolute compassion and humility. He's um, he learned to compassion. He, he got his powers and his, you know, his physicality from Krypton, but he became special here with us, like from, from the Kents. That's how he, that's where he learned to be become a great hero, you know, where he learned to, you know, do his chores without using his powers and how to, right. you know, the value of a day is hard work and how, you know, that you're not better than everyone else, even though you can do these amazing things that you're, you know, you do, you take care of others first, you know, that's, um, I love that's, that's who he is. So that, that compassion that he gets from the Kents is, is who he is at his core. And I love that he's, he's, uh, so humble and caring and like has this absolute love for, for everything. And Yeah. So yeah, me, people focus so much on his power, but his power is in how he restrains himself and doesn't always use it. That's yeah. the big, that's the bigger deal to me. It's like he could do all this stuff, but he doesn't. He restrains himself, like you said, he humbles himself, which he doesn't have to do, but he chooses to do. Yeah, it's, I mean, this at this point in history, I think it's, it's so important to see to have an example of someone who has the power to do whatever, and it's just this this bastion of compassion and humility. Like to me, that, that that's who he is. And yeah, the power should never ever be the point of the story. The power should only be there to illustrate how incorruptible he is. How he has the power to do some, you know, anything they wants, and um, instead he always does the right thing, even when it appears to other, you know, maybe it appears to someone else is the weak thing. There's a part um, in I'm reading a Justice League by Scott Snyder and uh, James Tinian. I'm on book. I just finished book two. And to your point, there's a part where he's called to space um, and he's zipping off to space, but he stops to rescue like a little puppy and hand it to the kid. And then he zips back <laughs> off to space. And I'm like, that's Superman. Yeah. So yeah I, I, I'd love that. It's just a little scene. And there's so much going on in the book. But that little scene just to me, yeah, said that's Superman. Ben yeah. Uncle has a great comment about Philip's... Uh 
Superman Cosmic. tenure. They're yeah. talking about the father son relationship. Oh, uh, thanks. It's funny, Ben says, it's funny you came in as a cosmic architect, since I think the strongest part of the Superman action series was the beautiful father-son relationship that gave the series such a personal feel. Well, I'm definitely going to cry when I read it then, because I have a son, and so I, I would tell watching a father-son thing on TV or a movie or a book, I cry all the time now, so well, I'll probably tear up when I read that. <laughs> I cry at anything, so I'll cry. I'm sure I'll cry too. I hope so. Yeah, but the, uh, the future state issues, Superman Worlds of War, it's kind of my mission statement on who Superman is. Um, it's, a, it's a love letter to the, the anthology from the old days, uh, Superman 400. It's an anthology about Superman in the future. And um, it was this all-star anthology with the, the most, I mean, just the, all the greatest people who were alive at the time. I mean, there's a story in there illustrated by Frank Miller. There's a, there are pinups by <laughs> Will Eisner, uh, Jack Kirby, Steve Ditko, Mobius, uh, Steranko has a story in there. I think Shaken did the cover. Um, Sienkiewicz, just insane. It's an insane book, and it's it's just the the theme is just Superman in the future. Like what's what's he doing? What's he like? What's the world like after his influence? Um, I just love that book. So I wanted to kind of in, encapsulate that idea. I mean, we're literally doing future state, and it just seemed like the perfect opportunity to kind of try to sum up what that book was. So the first issue is all about what Superman means to us. We see the earth after he's left earth. Nobody knows why. There's this memorial in, in what is called Rocket Field where he fell to earth, where now he's memorialized. And there's this little group of people he saved during his lifetime that gets together to remember him. And they kind of theorize about where he is now. They talk about stories about how they were saved by him and talk about where they think he went and why they think he left. And they all just kind of talk about what Superman means to them. Um, so that's what that issue is about, what he means to us. Uh, this issue? No. Oh, you're talking about you, the... I'm say, oh, I'm sorry. I'm saying, is that this book? Superman 400? That's, that's, that's Batman. Yeah, yeah. It does look oh. like that, but it's, super, it's <laughs> Superman, <laughs> Superman 400. Stupid yeah. Thing? It's a Superman it's version like, of that. Yes. I'll find it. Gosh darn it. Come here, you. <laughs> Superman 400. Come here. So how much longer is your run going to be, do you think, on Superman or action? <laughs> um, I think it's going to be a good bit. I, I mean, assuming, okay. assuming, That's good to hear. I mean, assuming things go as planned, I mean, if sales completely tank, that could change everything. But if, you know, <laughs> if, if things are continue to be well-received, I think it'll go for a long way. We have a lot of big stuff planned, and it's going to go for, for a good while. Well, there's a Superman's definitely. in good hands right now with you and Tom Taylor. So you, it sounds like, a, yeah, sounds like a knockout of the park. Thank you. Here, so I, here I thought I could do a good thing with the DC Universal app, and it gave me Batman 400 instead. <laughs> in so face. tell your bosses that it needs a little work. Yeah. Tim <laughs> Lee, get on this. Yeah. <laughs> I'm pretty sure he's the app guy. He's like the guy that messes with the app. <laughs> Breakfast of Champions says, as a band geek and comic reader, I'm a big fan, PKJ. Oh, thanks, man. Yeah, this... Band, band geeks are the best people. <laughs> Breakfast <laughs> of Champions. He got it from the man himself. Good for exactly. you. Well, we have about seven minutes left for with you. Um, I'm happy to talk about whatever you'd like to talk about. I can tell the chat if you, if you have any questions for him, now's the time because we have... Oh, wait, is it? It's 9.57. Okay, we have three minutes left. We can go you. a few minutes over. Okay. Uh now uh, we did start just a couple minutes late. Um, okay. If you have any questions for him, uh, now is the time to ask. As as we're coming to the close of it, uh, is there anything we haven't covered that you'd um, like to? Um, are there future projects, or are you focused strictly on Superman right now? No. Well, I mean, there's there's other stuff coming out soon. I've got um, I've got a story in the Gotham City Villains issue that comes out. I want to say the end of October. Um, October, November. Sorry, I forget me. I should know this. But <laughs> the next couple of months, uh, Gotham City Villains comes out. There's actually a Penguin story in there by Danny DeVito, which is kind of cool. And uh, <laughs> that's awesome. <laughs> and I have a, a Rachel Ghoul story with the great Ricardo Federici. Oh, and, and when is what is what is that going to be in? It's called Gotham City Villains. Um, I can't remember. I want to say it's coming out around Halloween time, but it might be November. I think it's I think it's October, but I'm not 100 percent certain. Um, but it's going to be an incredible issue. The stories in there look nuts. Um, and I'm incredibly proud of our Rachel Ghoul story. I've got a lot of love for the Al Ghouls for sure. 
there's a Talia story in there by somebody too. There's yeah, there's a lot of, a lot of really cool stories in that book. Um, awesome. I've got um, I've got a story that ties in my my last issue of the War World Rising arc. Superman comes out next week, and then the in October the War World Saga begins, and that's with Superman and the Authority coming out of Grant Morrison's series. Oh. Um, yeah, okay, I, I cannot wait to read this. The authority is woefully underused, so I'm so excited about yeah, that. Yeah, not anymore. So, that's yeah. gonna be awesome. <laughs> it's gonna that's be awesome. awesome. And there's a there's that's an issue here. There's a single issue that's coming out in November that go that ties those arcs together. So there's an issue um, that kind of comes between this month's Action Comics and next month's called Batman, Superman, and the Authority. That's a special that comes as a double sized thing coming out in November, and that's with two artists. And it's not because of time constraints; it's like a creative decision that we did with uh, uh, Trevor Harrison and Ben Templesmith. Mm. Really excited about that one. I've got a Red Sonia story coming out. And uh, Red Sonia, red, uh, black, white, and red coming out in October. I'm a huge Red Sonia fan. This is the most badass Red Sonia you will ever see on a page. <laughs> <laughs> um, He's I laying down the gauntlet. Yeah, full stop. <laughs> I mean, I, I will wholeheartedly lay that down like bring it <laughs> okay. is this an yeah. arc is it a mini series what it's is just it a, it's just one short story one short but story it's, it's so kick-ass it's with a guy if you check out if anyone wants to check out my website philipkennellyjohnson.com there's a there's a black and white period horror book called um the lost boys of the u-boat bremen that i did with this artist that you might not have heard of named steve beach <clears throat> Steve Beach has since done. He actually, Steve Beach has an issue in the Last God Compendium. Uh, he did the uh, the spinoff issue that Dan Waters wrote. Oh, okay. And super talented guy. I mean, just a, he's a horror savant. Um, there's a short story. Uh, sorry, there's a poem in the back of uh, Last God number two called uh, Grindel, if you remember. And the Grindel is the monster in that spinoff issue. And Steve did a really cool job with that. So yeah, he's got this crazy horror sensibilities. And Steve wrote this 10 page Red Sonia story with me and just crushed the shit out of it. <laughs> I mean, it's, he's unbelievable. And um, yeah, it's called the Iron Queen. And, and that's, that's a single issue from Dynamite? It's a single story in a single issue. So the, the, the black, white, and red oh, okay. series is an anthology that Dynamite's putting out right now monthly. And every, like, Gail Simone has a story in one of those. Um, I, I'm sure Amy Chu has one in there because she did a really great. Mm. Uh, um, Sonya run as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, every issue. Uh, there's one issue of these stories coming out every month, and uh, the one that my story is in comes out in October. So, I highly recommend that. Um, let's see what else. The first issue of the second arc of Alien came out today. Um, issue number seven, Alien Seven, Alien Revival, is what it's called, and that just hit shelves today. I'm very proud of it. If you uh, hopefully people read the first arc. Uh, first arc, uh, Alien Bloodlines, is kind of the story of how Whale and Yutani, uh, Whale and Yutani finally gets their whole their hands on the Xenomorph, and um, follows a father son thing, as uh, as we discussed, but not very Superman like. <laughs> Superman's kind of like, <laughs> Superman's kind of the ideal father that I try that I strive to be like, whereas this is more this is about a uh, this is more like a cautionary tale. This is a character named Gabriel Cruz and his son. Um, that was the first arc, Alien Bloodlines. The second arc. It's kind of the start of the new, the next movie, you know, um, and it takes place on a terraformed moon off world. And this uh, this sect of faithful from Earth that has been kind of persecuted on Earth called the Spinners have, um, have become the caretakers of this terraformed moon off world hired by the United Americas to to uh, do their first terraforming project, kind of compete with Whale yutani And it's kind of like a almost like an Amish type group that's very low tech, very anti um, anti artificial intelligence, anti technology, anti corporation, blah blah blah, and it's led by this woman named Jane who um, has this degenerative disease that she can't get treated because of the the rules of the faith. Which her, her body's kind of falling apart, and she's you know taking care of these people, and everything goes horribly wrong, and she has to <laughs> protect her flock from the the perfect organism. No, it's a it's a matchup I really like. I'm very proud of those characters, and it's it's pretty fun. Lots of world building again. I get to invent another religion, and uh, more creepy songs, and all the stuff I love doing. <laughs> cool. So, is the continuity that it's Alien and Aliens, then your comic follows after that, or is there still yeah. Alien Three and Alien Four? Is that I mean, gone? I mean, technically, it happens after Alien Three, but it does not rely on the events of Alien Three. Um, okay. Because Alien Three also happens off world and doesn't really have a whole lot of 
impact on um, on events back home, except effects. So Alien Three, Alien Four are still canon in the Alien universe. I'm, I'm confused. It seems like they're kind of yes. getting rid of it. <laughs> I, well, yeah, it, it depends. It's kind of you can kind of choose your own adventure. I mean, it's I got it. The first two <laughs> movies are sacrosanct. Like right, like yeah. There's no questioning the the um legitimacy of alien or aliens those movies are tens out of ten everyone loves them they're definitely canon for sure full stop um the i have you have to say that the prequels are too and i actually like the prequels a lot not everyone does but i, I really like prometheus and covenant those are definitely canon as well because really scott made them and that's just how it is um <laughs> aliens, yeah. if sir ridley scott makes it it's canon <laughs> yeah alien three um I like that movie a lot and I think it's a great ending for the Ripley character. I mean, there's things that suck. I mean, there's these <laughs> beloved characters that die off screen and there's, you know, people get pissed and I get that. Um, plus there's the, the question of the dark horse comic, the fact that there's already kind of been retconned in different versions of continuity, like whether Hicks and Newton everyone survive, that's kind of been disputed. So, and plus there was, there was almost that Blomkamp, um, sequel that was going to follow Hicks's story after that. Like Hicks was going to be in that film. So it's, it's not, it's not uh, exactly <clears throat> put to bed about who survives the events of the second film. So I didn't want my alien arc to rely on alien three. No, I like alien three. I think there's a very real possibility that someday alien three is going to get retconned. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I wanted to kind of keep alien three off the table and alien four. I just, like hate that film. I, I think it's. Uh, <laughs> I don't think I mean, you're alone feeling that way. Yeah, I think it's fan fiction. <laughs> I just kind of don't think about it. Um, there's some cool moments, but it's not. I don't know. I just don't like it. Anyway, so I resurrection, whatever. But um, <laughs> yeah, so it relies on the first two movies. I mean, you can still read the books without knowing the films, um, but it, it rewards fans of the first two films. Like, if Bishop, you haven't watched you know, those, what's wrong with you? Like, come the, on, the first two yeah. films. Yeah, if someone hasn't watched Alien Aliens, it's like you gotta yeah. you have to watch them they're and read this book and read your book. They hold up so well. I can't believe how well these. I mean, they're made the same time as Star Wars, and they to me they just hold up so much better. Like it's just, ah, I love those movies. Okay, this mo this interview's over. <laughs> Sorry, man. Speaking <laughs> uh, of that, did you guys watch Star Wars Visions today? I have. I didn't yet. All right. Well, then don't hold your fandom over me then. I already saw the first one. <laughs> Is it the whole show or just one episode at a time? I would recommend watching them. I mean, I okay. I can't speak to that because I've only seen the first one. But I read online that if you if you mainline them all together, that they kind of get repetitive because you know I'm sure there's lightsaber battles in all of them. Um, apparently they kind of get repetitive if you if you just take them all in at once. But if you watch them one at a time, they get a more clear vision for each one. That first one is probably my favorite Star Wars video I've ever seen. Wow! Wow! I'll I, watch that tonight then. I okay. Love the shit out of it. It's like it's it's just all in. So you know about you know the influence of Kurosawa on the original films, right? And like Lucas has gone on the record about that a lot. A lot. Um, they just go all in on the Kurosawa influence, and it's just the coolest thing ever. I mean, I just, I love it. Love the first one. So highly recommend. The other ones I can't. I haven't seen them, so I can't say. I'll definitely watch that first one tonight at least. Yeah. Um, I mean, it's perfect. We don't want. I, I'm not gonna. I'm not trying to change the subject. But Ben is threatening to riot in the chat, and I can't have a riot in the chat. Um, oh, if ben. the Crime Corner hosts, we have a show called Crime Corner because um, we love crime books. Don't ask Philip about <laughs> his great crime story, Smoke Town. I'm rioting. All right, just calm down, Ben. I asked him about it. So this guy is my friend. <laughs> <laughs> ben, you hear that? So yeah, I um Smoke Town is a blue collar crime noir story that I'm very proud of. It takes place. It was that was meant to be just a one shot. So the first issue is still on my website as a just because I'm I haven't updated it. It's, it's still on my website as uh, as being called Killing Marcus. And this is something I did with a couple of friends um, who are also musicians. So who for those who don't know, my day job is music in, in the army. And um I have these other two friends, like this guy that I played in the Glenn Miller band with, Scott Van Domlin, who I did not know at the time. I mean, back then, I wasn't even reading comics then, really, because I was just on the road all the time. Um, Scott is a super talented artist and comics fan, and we just never talked about that on the road when I, back when I knew him. Um, and now he lives in Washington, D.C., not far from me, um, just from you know dumb circumstance. And there's also another, so he plays saxophone. Um, 
let's see. And there's another guy, Dustin Mollick, who's a crazy talented Barry Sax player who played with me in the jazz ambassadors at my, the jazz component of my, where I work. And also was a very talented artist. And he and I ended up doing a web comic together. And at some point they're like, let's do a comic just for fun. When I, when things started taking off for me in comics, they're like, let's do a comic just for the hell of it. And so I just wrote the story for them to do just for, for grins called uh, killing Marcus about this woman who has to hide her husband's body before morning, just a one shot. And at around the same time at a convention, I want to say Heroes Con, I met um, Jim Pruitt, who had just become um, the editor in chief, I think, or chief creative officer or something at um, at Scout Comics. They had just done that. And he was like, hey, we're looking for content. And I really like this, this one shot that you guys did. Let's make it into a series and print it. And I was like, dude dies at the end. <laughs> what are we going to do, do with this? And they're like, oh, we'll figure it out. Let's do figure it out. Do a series. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, okay, wait, sure. All right. So we uh, ended up making it into a kind of a Pulp Fiction style anthology where it's these different chapters that intersect through different characters. If you've seen, hopefully everyone here has seen Pulp Fiction, but there's a, oh, yeah. these chapters that all kind of stand alone, but the characters weave in between the chapters and make it into one kind of umbrella narrative. So Smoketown is like that too. Every issue um, is its own chapter, but well, for the first five or six issues, that's the case. <clears throat> and then it kind of becomes more of a, um, a linear story by the end. There's eight issues total. Um, but what began as a story about this woman killing her husband, her abusive husband, um, ended up being a story more about that husband and how he became the way that he was. Like the second issue kind of takes a step back and becomes about the husband. He's this army vet and how he became, like what happened to him overseas. And then the third issue takes another step back. And it's about the the guy who who hires him at this black, this uh, blue collar job when he comes home again. He's kind of become this crime boss in this little town. And then in the story, and then it takes another step back and it's about this, um, this uh, illegal immigrant, this migrant worker who um, works for that same guy. And you just see all these different characters who kind of been been uh, kind of fallen between the cracks of society in this little blue collar town, and how their lives intersect. And you know, you start to see this bigger picture of this um, invisible criminal side of this uh, supposedly sleepy little town. And we can pick that up from Scout Comics. Yeah, it's a it's a trade right now. All eight issues in Scout Comics. It's actually being uh, developed for TV right now by Film Nation. Holy oh, wow. guacamole. Yeah. So this is, okay. Smoketown is a graphic. Okay. Is a collected graphic, it collected edition. Yeah. Okay. So I'll make sure I put, um, I'll make sure I put uh, that in the description too. So Smoketown. And um, so, um, is, that, is that this, I, I, I got a, a little bit confused. Killing Marcus was the one, <clears throat> that you did with your musician friends, are they involved with Smoketown? Yeah, also? they did the whole thing. Okay, yeah. it's just these these two saxophonists who just like to draw, <laughs> and and they did this great book. I mean, you can see, especially Scott, you can see how his work just gets better every issue because he's 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 making his first comics ever, and now he's he's done all this other work since then. Like he's done a lot of stuff for Scout since then. He's kind of become their like guy. And um, wow, and I think very soon he's going to be doing some some other work for other other uh, publishers. He's he's really come a long way. So yeah, I'm very proud of those issues. I'm proud of those characters too. So thanks a ton, Ben, for saying that. Yeah, thanks, Ben. I and appreciate Ben's a that. French horn player. He said so. He's yeah. he's expected you to be friends. That's awesome. That was hard, man. <laughs> Easy to miss <laughs> notes on that thing. Well, we're nine minutes over. We want to respect your time. I know you got a lot to do. Yeah, well, thanks so much. It's really a pleasure to meet you guys and the the fans who are in the chat as well. Thanks for all your questions and great comments. Um, oh, let me sorry, sorry. Let me grab a couple of questions on my way out here. Okay, which ones? Um, inside info about the upcoming upcoming Aliens TV series. Not that I can reveal. I'm sorry. Uh, I don't know as much as I would like anyway. <laughs> but I uh, uh, nothing I can reveal here. Uh, Liam is asking about. Says I, I love that you're using Mongol in action. What's your take on him as a character? Is there a specific reason you chose him? Yeah, various reasons. So for one thing, he got a lot of heat in the in the Bendis run, and I love at the end of that. I've always kind of seen Mongol as an underutilized character, and very often kind of a one dimensional character. He's one of those big, growly, muscly alien guys that kind of looks like the other ones. He kind of like he's kind of like a like a lesser Thanos or a lesser Dark Side, and I don't know. I just never he never spoke to me. There was nothing about him that really made him different or better. 
Um, and I don't know, like in some stories, you can always kind of be replaced by another, another version of that, that trope. And I wanted a new version. So Bendis did the very kind um, favor of killing him in his story <laughs> and by, his, by his son, who's basically identical. And um, <clears throat> at first when they were talking about, about Mongol, I was like, Oh my God, Mongol. Like, I don't know, man. I just, he didn't speak to me, but I started thinking more about the opportunity that we had in front of us and how I refused to just let him be in like a lesser version of a lesser character, <laughs> you know, like, in the, you know, an even less threatening version of Mongol. Like, how can we make him more threatening? How can we, how can we make him completely different? Um, so to me, the antithesis of Superman would be uh, a slaver, basically. Like the, the way that um, Superman represents compassion and humility um, and, you know, freedom and hope and all these things that we, that we value. Mongol, I, I wanted, I decided to create this cult of slavery on war world. I kind of thought more about the way I thought about last, you know, answer every question with a question, uh, in last God, I kind of put that same lens on war world. Like what would war world be like? Really? It's not just, I don't, I refuse, refuse to tell the story about a big shiny metal planet with guns sticking out of it. And that's just all there is to it. Like I, it's, it's supposed to be a, a planet with millions of people living there, like presumably like, you know, are at the very least a gigantic army of bad guys. So let's, you know, let's take that further. Let's say, you know, they're when, as they're conquering worlds, surely they're taking prisoners as slaves and, you know, from all these different alien worlds across the, the galaxy or the universe or the omniverse. Um, so war world eventually would be kind of become this crazy melting pot of these, like these last bastions of, of all these different civilizations. And this, so it almost becomes like this enslaved zoo where you have like these, these tiny little bits of pockets of culture that don't exist anywhere, but on war world um, that could make for a really fascinating culture. And I started to envision, you know, thinking about, you know, modern day politics, I started to envision this whole cult of personality on a war world and what the, what the propaganda would look like and what their, what the um, the religion would look like, and how that how Mongol would maintain control over a, a society like that, and it sort of fleshed out this whole idea of what war world would look like, and that's what we're exploring in the war world saga. So that's how Mongol sets himself apart now. Like the the way that the Fremen on Dune are all about water scarcity, and how every aspect of their culture is based around that one concept of just you know desert. Like that's what has dictated everything about them. On War World, for the War Zunes, that central tenet is the concept of dominance, of just dominating others, killing others, taking what's theirs. The concept of the the chain that that binds them all, and how that that represents their entire culture. So that's what we're doing with with Mongol and with War World. You pretty much got the biggest compliment I've seen in a long time from Triscotti. Oh yeah, ten thirteen. Oh man, thanks. That's a, I don't know what to say to that. It's such a great ever. Compliment. Boom. In your face, Batman. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you can tell Jim Lee when you're complaining to him about the app that there was a suspicious amount of Superman Unchained there that popped yeah. up when I was looking for Superman 400. Exactly. Screenshot. <laughs> Last yeah, one. I will. I should send that to you and have him uh, have you send that. Have you send it to him? Uh, That'd be awesome. Actually, let me, let me grab a screenshot too. Oh, do you want to get a screenshot of that? Uh, this part? <laughs> sure, I'll, well, I'm not going to say no there. No, I just meant one of us like talking. Oh, okay. <laughs> I'm bad about. Yeah, I'm bad about doing this. So, um, well, and Omni Dog who laughs says thank you for being so generous with your time and answering our questions because this is oh, the first live interview we've ever done. Oh, that's really. I'm honored, guys. Thanks so much. Yeah, yeah we usually do pre-recorded, and we thought we'd give it a try, and it seemed to go really well. It's great oh, to have everyone so interact. Yeah, I'm glad it worked out. Yeah, I uh, fans didn't see this part. But uh, computer crashed like right before this, and I was like, "Oh my god, this might not work." <laughs> uh, yeah. um, and I will put <clears throat> in the description uh, of this chat everything that I can find on you. I imagine I'll start at your website, philipkennedyjohnson.com. Yeah, there's a couple of web comics on there that you can't find anywhere else. There's the Killing Marcus, which is now Smoke Down Issue One. Okay, um, that kind of sets the stage for that whole series. There's also um, uh, Lost Boys of the U-Boat Bremen, illustrated by Steve Beach, which is incredibly well illustrated at the very least. That's my first my first finished comic, actually, was Lost Boys of the U-Boat Bremen. So if you want to see a, 
an earlier, more wordy version of myself. It's all on there and beautiful, creepy black and white. <laughs> um, and actually, it shows, that's the first language I ever invented for a comic, which I actually I have on my wall. Let me grab that. <clears throat> actually, not only has he created one language, he's created many languages. Actually, that's I shouldn't show you that. I'm sorry. There's a very super creepy, very spoilery image, so I'm, I shouldn't show that. I apologize. Oh, okay. It is, it is an, at the very end of the first issue of Lost Boys, the Yuba Brennan. So I highly recommend you check it out because that art is insane. Um, there's also links to a ton of my work. Um, on that website. There's some blog posts that I've not updated in years. Uh, there's all, <laughs> all, all kinds of stuff, links to my social media. So please check it out. That's great. I, we really appreciate your being on here. And thanks to the chat for your thoughtful questions. Uh, thanks to the Minister of Comics for uh, bringing Philip Kennedy Johnson to the channel. And uh, you were a fantastic guest. I really appreciate your taking your time to be with us. My pleasure, guys. Thanks so much for the time. Thanks for having me on. And thanks to the, all the readers and fans on there. Please look me up online and keep talking. Yeah, thank you to the chat. And uh, peace and love, peace and love. Thanks. You can always subscribe to the channel, hit the like button, and feel free to leave a comment. Yeah, smash that like button. Do me a favor. Even, uh, <laughs> yeah, don't unlike it, but like it. Whatever, you know, help us on the algorithm. Okay, thanks, I've, talk I've talked enough. Okay, good night.